It's Wednesday night, and we're live from Oaksdale, Washington, in the Educated Touch Studio. Welcome to Ethics Outside the Box, with your host, Nathan Nordstrom. Special guests include... And you. Here he is, Nathan Nordstrom. Thank you for joining me today. We are once again talking about ethics and the implication to massage therapists and massage therapy as a whole. Um, we do go all over the place a little bit here and there, but we really do want to kind of make sure that we're connected. You know, right now we're actually in the standards of practice, and in the standards of practice, we are excited because we have a couple of different pieces. Um, the first one is that with the standards of practice, we actually have um, just started a new standard of practice. I'm going to hit mute on that computer so I don't hear ding, ding, ding as people are talking. Looks like we got a couple of you who are joining us this evening. Uh, Daniel, you can uh, feel free to sign into your email if you would like. Uh, hey, Maureen, it's good to see you again. Let's uh, connect right there. Perfect. So standard of practice, we are down to standard number three. It took us a while to get down here, but I wanted to make sure that um, we were all understanding and excited about it. It's uh, a really interesting piece to kind of reconnect with the importance of each of the standards. So if uh, we go to the website, the internet here, um, you see me about three to four seconds ago. Um, and then we go to the National Certification Board of Therapeutic Massage and Body Workers. I actually wanted to hit this page real quick because if you scroll down, we I have already clicked this button of join the NCB certification board. Hey there, how are you doing, Dan? Good, how are you? Good, good, good. All right. So my... Uh, I'm going to just hold off on what pages I'm at and uh, introduce my friend Dan. Dan, um, Dan's from New York. Dan is, uh, I have to say, when I think of New Yorkers, your face pops into my mind <laughs> it, because it's not that I don't know other New Yorkers, but you are kind of the lifeblood of what I think of when I think of New York. Fair enough. I mean, <laughs> congratulations, I guess. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's a compliment or an insult, but I'll, I'll take it either which way. <laughs> it's all in love. That's all in love. Um, Dan actually does a lot of wonderful things and has done a lot of wonderful things. And that's kind of why when we had talked in the past, I had said I wanted you on here was because I don't know very many people who could pull from the number of professions in your background to really connect with what the effects of um, ethical choices are for massage therapists. And so, Dan, can you give us a quick rundown about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I have been in the massage therapy industry since 2011. It's when I graduated. Um, uh, practicing for about six plus years, hands-on. Um, and then dove into spa management to a newly opening handstone for which the company that I work for corporate now with, with uh, our lovely host, Nathan. And I, um, I got to say, I have been able to really been a, be a huge advocate for massage therapists across the board from being a massage therapist, a spa manager, now a corporate trainer uh, who travels across the nation, kind of shares my story and shares my hardships and my, uh, my pitfalls and as well as my successes as a massage therapist and a male in the industry and the challenges that have been posed our way like no other. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, uh, it's interesting to me to see how massage therapists um, may come from many different backgrounds. And, and when I see a person come in, I usually tell them their first market is the people that they know about. They know about experience of a, um, they, if they were an office worker, they, they know what it feels like to have their hands work on that keyboard for hours on end. Um, if they were a construction worker, they know what it feels like to hold that jackhammer for several hours. Um, they have all these different pieces and all these different things to really connect with 
and uh, and get us going. Just a moment. FedEx just delivered me a package uh, via my son. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will get back to that later. Um, yeah, so being able to really connect with your history and connect with those pieces, that's really a, a powerful thing. However, there's a secondary piece to that that I don't usually address very often, and that is massage therapists who have a skill in another set. So they're already a manager. They're already... Um, know how to connect with people or are great communicators. You know, those are those pieces where if they can come from another industry and look at what massage therapy is lacking in those areas, like yourself, you can really pull into training and pull into understanding because you've got that background. And so I, I just appreciate the variety of massage therapists out there. I, I just saw the statistic again, 21% of massage therapists are coming directly out of high school. So wow. that means 79% to 81%, somewhere in there, are second career, they've done something else, and either they didn't like it, and they wanna find something they have a passion for, or they liked it, but they retired, or some other aspect, but they wanted to come to a massage after the fact. These are amazing numbers for us as a profession, because then we get that variety. Um, it also says a couple of things about the massage therapy profession as people don't go, hey, you know what? Uh, right out of school, I'm going to become a massage therapist. That can be income. That can be so many other things about the industry that, that's out there. But it's really interesting to kind of hit that dichotomy and kind of connect with. All right. So thank you for joining me. Appreciate Not it. From. All right. So I'm going to go back to getting this fly out of my face. Um, <laughs> He, he's going to bug me all night. I guarantee that. All right. So we're going to go back to the National Certification Board website. Um, every week I have us come to the ncbtmb.org. The reason why I use the National Certification Board is because it's nationwide and it creates a standard for the entire country. Now, if you see this first page, join the NCB Certification Board. They are uh, going through elections that will go through, I think, uh, March is when the start of the new election period would be, um, but applications are going in now. So if you're interested in becoming a leader with the National Certification Board, uh, if you're board certified, all that kind of fun stuff, we're always willing to have you come join us and participate. Um, we've got meetings that are exciting because we're really looking at the future of the industry. Um, it goes through and tells you more about it, but I just wanted to make sure people knew that that is something that is out there going on. All right, so once again, going to the National Certification Board's website, scrolling all the way to the bottom, if you haven't heard me say it enough times, and then you have the About Us, uh, about the National Certification Bylaws, you have board, uh, Certification Board itself, who's on it, that kind of stuff, Code of Ethics, NCB policies and standards of practice. We've gone through the code of ethics before. Now we're heading to the standards of practice. We are right on standard of practice number three, which we're starting it out now, and it is confidentiality. Now I am excited about this one because I have seen confidentiality screwed up so many times in so many different ways, and I want to make sure that it's addressed and connected in all the different possibilities where confidentiality really can become a problem. Um, massage therapists have gotten in trouble in many different ways, and this is the, the breakdown of that. So a certificate should respect the confidentiality and client, uh, of client information and safeguard all records. It is his or her professional role, the, certifi uh, the certificate shall. Standard 3A, perform a confidential, uh, sorry, protect the confidentiality of the client's identity and inform in all conversations. Wait, wait. I can't hear myself, and that's becoming nasty, gnarly. Protect the confidentiality of the client's identity and information in all conversations, advertisements, and any and all other matters unless disclosure of identi uh, identifiable information is requested by the client in writing 
is medically necessary or is required by law. Dan, have you ever had any experience with uh, confidentiality breaches heard connected with any of those stories? Absolutely, I have. Um, I had quite a, quite a few of them. <laughs> um, what, one of which was, that was stands out the most is I had a massage therapist um, that had found out about a client's spouse passing away. And they not only divulged the information throughout the session, but they went ahead and shared whatever information there was collected in the break room, in the lobby, in multiple places. And one of the people actually happened to be friends of that spouse. The, and it got back to that spouse, and that person came very, very angrily back to the spa saying, what kind of business are you running here? You know, what kind of rumor mill is this? And, you know, it definitely left me feeling very uncomfortable. It's to this day, made my skin crawls from that instance, but it's certainly a, <laughs> a huge problem. Well, and, and you have a couple of different pieces where it's name. I mean, name is easily the first one that when you're thinking of confidentiality, oh, you know, Susie, uh, yeah, I worked on her. You worked on her last week. Yeah, I worked on her this week. She was talking about this. That's a breach of confidence. Absolutely. Even if you're talking to the other massage therapist in the spa, it's a breach of confidence. Now, what is the opposite of that? Appropriate documentation of the session. Now, most spas that I know and uh, most clinical massage therapists um, that are out there and most massage therapists who are practicing on their own understand that documentation is mandatory and that you're documenting your experience appropriately. You're making sure that you're collecting data that is um, prevalent to the session. I, I've heard many times, well, what's prevalent to the session? And I've seen soap notes and of massage therapists that have information that doesn't relate to the session at all. Um, and I owned a spa years ago. Um, and as I was working in the spa, I was running the show and getting everything going. And part of my challenge was I had 17 massage therapists, two estheticians. The place was hopping. We only had one, two, three. We only had four rooms, but we had people in constantly. And so as I got a fax, this was back in the day, yes, I'm old. Uh, I got a fax and it said, hey, we're requesting your uh, medical records on this client of ours who was in a car accident. And the last medical provider who was seen was your massage therapist. I was excited. I thought, perfect, let me go grab this. I ran up to, back at those days, it was a file cabinet, pulled the file cabinet open, found his name, pulled out his file, flipped over the card to the back is where they kept the notes, looked down for the date, and the date, that sign said, he's cute and tips well. <sighs> that, wow. <laughs> that helped him not at all in his case. If the massage therapist would have said, had a minor headache or... Um, had normal mobilization or, or uh, came in for just general tension or stress, that would have said so much for this, for this client because then they could have gone through the court system and say, hey, we have a medical professional who's a massage therapist saying that this was their, they were in their standard state of health um, two days before the accident. I had to go to the lawyer and say, I'm sorry, we don't have any clinical documentation on this, on this client. It was painful. Um, and when I look at confidentiality, we're going to get later into making sure documents are right and making sure that it's disclosure. But I really like this piece at the end when they're talking about disclosure and they're saying, um, you have to make sure that there's only one of three cases uh, client in writing has written, said, hey, I want to this to, to be disclosed. Medical necessary. So their doctor has said, here, we need this record, we need this. And generally on all of those HIPAA forms, it has a line for that patient 
to sign or is required by law. And as well with it uh, required by law, it has um, either a subpoena for that documentation, which is signed by a judge, or it has a record where they have signed and said, yes, I want this record released. So all of those cases, unless it's signed by a judge, the client knows that the information is going out. So I, <laughs> your story is painful. However, I kind of have to go to an, another story, which I think is just as awful. Um, there was a client who, I, I live in a small town. Uh, if you haven't figured that out, I don't know where you've been. Um, but um, live in a small town, work in a slightly bigger town, but still small town. It's under 30,000. Um, and we have a thriving practice. And um, we really have great clients. And we had a client who got in a car accident. And it was a gruesome car accident. And people knew about the car accident. And one of the massage therapists was talking about working with this client who was just in a car accident, but didn't say anyone's name. However, it really did get around. And the other side of small towns is that the person who she was in a car accident with was at their church. And there was that cross communication that happened that people found out that you're connected with this person and you're connected with that person it becomes a divisive nature and a separation in the community. And that was really dangerous. That was really painful to see. But it's one of those pieces where you have to say, you as the massage, as the medical professional, the massage therapist, had the responsibility of keeping your documentation and keeping your client's identity safe. Yeah. All right. So, have you ever worked on a rock star, a athlete, a a super fill in the blank model, or anything else? Yes. Yes. And have you ever asked them to sign something saying that you can use their name in advertising, marketing? Um, you can use it in any type of press release or communication. Nope. You know, either have I. For some odd reason, I don't think of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but that is, I, I think, the first place that I see massage therapists go, oh, hey, I worked on this person. Yeah, yeah, he, he really had this and that messed up. Really? I mean, no, no self-worth? No, that, they're not humans. They're stars anymore. I'm sorry, as a medical professional, you don't get that, right? No. Please tell me. You know, one of, the, one of the things that I've always told people, like, don't you, do you ever get starstruck or do you ever get, you know, impressed by the people you're working on? I, I turn around and say, no, it's just another set of arms, legs, and another back to me. <laughs> you know, I, I've noticed that no matter who it is, they're all screwed up. Yeah, it's I, true. I don't know if you are getting massages daily because you're making seven, eight, nine, ten figures. Um, you're still messed up. You still have life. You still have things coming down and stress is coming on you. So being able to say, you know what, they're still human is huge. I, I had a lot of fun early on in my career. I worked in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming in a resort spa and it was just beautiful. And one of the big drug companies sent out their drug reps to, uh, to the spa. And it was hysterical because, first of all, their drug reps were well off financially, but uh, I had at that year's leading um, uh, little blue pill, a uh, Viagra salesperson on my table. And she used to be a cheerleader or something. And, and she was uh, attractive, but I didn't, I was in the treatment room. And it's, it's funny when people are like, well, aren't you attracted to your clients? No. <laughs> they're, they're a body. And you work on the body and you know what dysfunctions they were. And so being able to say, you know what, it's a person who's in need. That sure. really gets rid of that whole, well, I can disclose this person, but I can't disclose that person. 
absolutely. One of the things, actually, I, I have to chime in and say, when someone says, aren't you attracted to, a, you know, an attractive person on your table? And I turn around and said, no, actually, quite honestly, I envy their physique because I wish I could be in that kind of type of condition. <laughs> <laughs> but that's about it. That's my yeah. stuff. <laughs> I'm not there anymore. It's all gone still. <laughs> And you do, you recognize a fit person. Um, I've had several like uh, runners, marathon runners and that kind of stuff where you work on them and you're like, good Lord, you got like 3% body fat. How are you surviving? And then you kind of go into the concept of, okay, what can I do different to help this person that I won't have to do with someone else? Or how exactly. it's all about your treatment plan in your mind of how mm -hmm. to make this session better. You know, for me, I'm just, I'm always in awe of, of the human structure. Um, and so that really helps me connect with the benefits of helping a person. Now, what are some of the problems that can come from disclosing information? Uh, anything you can think of, Dan? Oh, a big one is one word you never want to hear as a massage therapist, lawsuit. It. it it does happen. <laughs> it does happen. If you disclose information that you're not entitled to or supposed to, one of the biggest, biggest fears, you know, that massage therapists have is that big L word is lawsuit, you know, because it's not your information to share first and foremost. And there's so many laws protecting that individual's privacy. And, and I, I was teaching in massage school early enough uh, in my career that um, I was dealing with HIPAA as it was new, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Um, and at that point, it almost felt like the Wild West because they were still changing things and moving them up. And what does this actually mean? And how does that actually work? Um, and really, the, the internet was up and working, but it wasn't really giving the important aspect that uh, it is now. Um, where that portability of information is so frequent. Um, and so when we started looking at what HIPAA was going to be and the responsibility, we were like, oh, don't worry, we won't ever get to that. And it wasn't five years later that we were like, we're there. I've seen people who have done those things, who don't have a double secure uh, security on their computer, who don't have um, themselves with a locked filing cabinet in a locked room. Um, I know a massage therapist who had their filing cabinet on their back porch in their office. Oh my God. Why? <laughs> Why? But it was secure because he had a little lock that, that locked the filing cabinet. <laughs> That's a head yeah. scratcher. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. And, and people, are, people are trying to not have to do more work. That's the thing that I always find in, in my mind is that people, it's not that they want to be stupid. It's not that they want to be crazy or they want to be, well, okay, most people want to be lazy, but they don't want to be, they don't want to do stuff that's going to hurt someone. They just don't want yeah. to have to effectively put effort out. And so when it comes down to it, how do we get stronger? How do we get better? Uh, we've all exercised before, right? Yep. Yeah. When you're in your fittest condition, what were you doing? Maintaining a regimen. Yeah. So you're doing your active aspects. And then when something new happened or something new changed, you had to change it. You had to modify it. Mm -hmm. If you were no longer losing weight because the exercise you were doing wasn't affecting the core area that you were looking for, you had to change up your exercise routine. You know, that's just like everything else in life. If we're truly looking at ourselves and saying, um, we want to make sure that we're improving, we want to make sure that we're growing, when something comes up and we say, oh, okay, wait a second, are all of my documents actually completely secure? Find something that would say no and fix it. Because exactly. if I would rather have me pull something out or my friend pull something out and say, hey, you're not doing this or you're not doing that. And then I can correct it instead of, oh, having the government come down on me and say, hey, you haven't been doing this for this long. 
now you're going to give this much and you're going to have to do these other things. It's easier for us to check each other than to have someone else externally, uh, especially big brother come in and put us in check. Ah, uh, yes, I pulled out big brother. Um, <laughs> All right, so there is one example of someone that I don't know if they were doing it wrong or right, but I still have to put them out there. It was one of my friends, a massage therapist in Oregon, um, and they went down to the um, the uh, the hall, the the conference center, that kind of stuff, and they would regularly go to. Um, work with the musicians they would work with other people if you gotta go go man we're good yeah. <laughs> you good all right um so he would work with musicians and actors and all that stuff and at the end of a session when he'd work on someone he'd say hey would you sign the bottom of my table and they'd say yeah sure and so the bottom of his table had all these signatures of actors and athletes and musicians and that kind of stuff and so if someone asked him who he'd worked on, he'd flip it over and say, oh, okay, so here's, here's the people that I work with when I'm in town. Technically, he got their signature. Technically, he got their approval. And I don't remember seeing it, but if he had something typed up and written that he stapled onto the bottom of his massage table um, that said, hey, by signing this, I give you the right to... Uh, he could have. I don't feel like it's following the letter of the law. I don't think it's it's doing it right. But I can't say it's doing it absolutely wrong. I wouldn't do it. I, I honestly, I think it's a loophole that he found. Uh -huh. that it's still questionable. You know, it's still questionable. It's just kind of like if he hadn't had something written down stating that they willingly and knowingly gave their signature for this specific reason and then advertised that when he shows, people are asking, Who'd you, who have you worked on or who have you worked with? It says these signatures were given knowingly for this specific purpose. If yep. it doesn't state that, I don't think that he's in the green in that regard. I think that it's definitely more of a negative connotation and still the slippery slope in that regard. So here's where the gray of ethics fall, right? Everyone mm -hmm. draws their line. And I strive to draw my line way up on the hill so I'm not slipping anywhere down. And most people will draw their line someplace. And the challenge for me is, and the challenge for all of us, is when we look at another person and we see where they're at and we say, yeah, that's icky. Instead of saying you're evil and you're wrong because they're not evil, they're not wrong. They're just closer to that edge. And I would be more willing to give a warning call and say, hey, that looks icky. That doesn't look like a comfortable spot for me. I would much rather be way back on the other side and saying, yeah, you know what? Do what you got to do. <laughs> um, I don't think that's a safe thing. I think someone could easily sue you and you could get in trouble. Um, but now that you have the warning, you're looking down thinking, nah, I have four inches from the edge. I'm still good. And I'd rather be seven feet. <laughs> so nice. it, it, the standards of practice I, I love because they really kind of spell out the code of ethics and say specifically, hey, here's what you can and cannot do. And so being able to say, protect the confidential of the client's identity and information in all conversations, advertisements, and in any and all other matters, unless uh, disclosure of identifiable information is requested by the client in writing, is medically necessary or is required by law. You know, I've also seen in a lot of uh, a lot of spa commercials, they have actual customer and they have like an interview with the actual customer. Well, that's right because they have given themselves and they've said and they've signed something to say, "Hey, I want to give a testimonial of my experience with this." You know what? That's in writing. 
and they're giving that freely. That's where you go right. Where you go wrong is when you're hearsay. Uh, you want to hear another horrible story? <laughs> sure, go ahead. It, it, I am so full of these horrible stories. I'm so sorry. Um, actually, this is kind of not even on topic, but I still have to kind of connect it there. Uh, there was a massage therapist who um, he got interviewed by his local news station um, as a sports massage therapist, and and they kind of connected with this guy and. Follow, followed through with him. And then when he was saying all these things that he was doing, they're like, Oh, wow, that's interesting. You're going to the, um, you're going to the Olympics and you're doing this and you're doing that. And you've worked with these different sports teams. And so you, Oh, you've worked on these athletes. Oh, wonderful. Oh yeah. I think we know a couple of those. Well, they followed up with the athletes and they didn't know them. And so they then kind of went through and they were like, you know what, we got to do an expose on this guy to figure out what he's actually done. And so they went back and they checked his license. They checked everything. He was a licensed massage therapist. He didn't have the certifications that he claimed. He hadn't worked with any of the teams that he had claimed. He had made it all up. And yet he's disclosing things. And so when they came out and they did this whole expose and they were following him out to his car, um, Hey, you, you lied about this and you lied about that. And Hey, we, we've talked to this person and that person. And they don't, what do you have to say about it? He's like, Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. He caught himself in a lie. And that's, that's a ugly spot to be in. That's, oh, that's absolutely. a, he didn't just build that lie today and decide, ah, I'm going to tell a little lie. Wow. That's a, a <laughs> lifetime career choice of, yeah. of deceit. Talk about a shot in the, in your own, shooting yourself in your own foot. Well, and, and you're shooting yourself in the foot, but you're also disclosing information and putting names out there and putting connections out there that can be followed up. Yeah. Um, and so if you've got people who are going to say, no, you didn't because you're lying, or mm -hmm. even people saying, yes, what did they tell you about me? Both of those stories are dangerous spots to be in. They're not comfortable places. No. They have issues in how they are connected. Um, because it is, I hate to say it, it is the same thing. Lying and relieving yourself of information that is not yours to tell in so many ways is the same issue. All right, I just wanted to make sure that we had people. Uh, hey, Joan. Hey, Nic uh, Joan Nichols. Hey, Jennifer. Uh, Dean, you're still here. Good. Christopher Deary. Fly. Buggy, bugging you, dude. This fly is killing me, uh, Chris. You, you, you know what flies do to me. Um, <laughs> I do have an electric fly swatter, however, it's in the house, so uh, not in the office. I have to have to deal with it. All right, so let's go on to this next one because it uh, it kind of coincides and connects, and we just kind of want to make sure um, that we have all sides of this. Protect the interest of clients who are minors or clients who are unable to give voluntary and informed consent by obtaining prior written permission from the legal guardian. Whew. Minors. What are your thoughts on minors? <laughs> um, for me, um, earlier on, in, for me, when I was working, um, I had a situation where. I would work on a lot of my athletic minors. Um, these guys were football players, basketball players, so on and so forth. And I was doing pretty well for myself with them. And I would always make sure that the parents were there, had consent. And then I had this one group of parents mm -hmm. whom they felt that they could tell me how to massage their, their child. Uh. And they were micromanaging, controlling it, so to speak. And to the point where I was like, wait, why am I doing this? <laughs> I became really questioning, like, why am I even opening up my doors to this group of clientele that gives me that much grief? Is it worth it to me? And, you know, I had to do some serious, A, soul searching, and B, digging on the laws if I had the right to refuse that type of clientele. And so I, I 
luckily found out that in, you know, state of New York, I'm not sure how it applies out anywhere else, but if you refuse a group of people, you have to make sure all of them are being refused. You can't just say, oh, you're 17 and a half, I can go ahead and work on you because your birthday is in six months. No, you, you can't have any leniency towards it whatsoever. And so I made a, a very full uh, blanket policy for myself that I would not work on minors anymore for that specific reason. Now, I've spoken to a lot of other therapists about it, and they said, well, I'm a male in the industry. I don't feel comfortable working on, on minors. Um, I'm a female in the industry. I don't feel comfortable working on minors. You know, adolescence is not something I want to deal with. <laughs> um, needless to say, adolescence in itself is a very, very... It's a, in itself, it's got its own slippery slopes. <laughs> I, I loved working with a chiropractor years ago um, because in I was in the state of Oregon, but in the state of Oregon at that time, um, the laws for the state of Oregon for documentation and management of documentation mm -hmm. was seven years for documents, oh. unless they're a minor, and it's seven years until they're after they're no longer a minor. So oh. if you work on an eight-year-old, you have to hold on to their documents for 10 years plus seven years on top of that. So you had to hold on to their documents for 17 years. Wow. And to me, I was like, wow, that, that's painful um, to, to kind of look at the possibility of someone who's in their mid-20s that you worked on when you were eight coming back and saying, wait a second, so what was it that was going on when I was a child and, and being able to come to you and say, I need the documentation. You got to hold on to it. And so I, I had a great doctor who had great facility and everything was, we still were doing the uh, paper files. We had literally a room full and, and we had uh, one of the receptionists who a portion of her job was going and filtering out old files um, and shredding them and doing all of that. Um, hey, I wanted to say hello to Dr. Jeff Curls, Kohlers. He, uh, he's on. So he says hello to both of us. And then La Larissa, um, thanks. We, we are enjoying the conversation as well. It's, uh, it's going a little different, but we're having fun with it. Um, <laughs> so the other thing about children that I, I kind of look at and the challenge that's there, I, I love that you pulled up the having to deal with the parents and having to deal with um, the connection there. Uh, I've worked on several... Um, children, several young adults, um, and we've set up policies many times. And the, Hannah Stone's another one where it says, if you have a minor of this age, you have to be on the premises. If you have a minor at this age, you have to be in the room. Um, and those policies keep you safe so much. And just holding true as a massage therapist to you're the professional, you're the expert in the industry. Um, you're the person who they're coming to for their experience. It doesn't matter if they're a doctor or they're a chiropractor or they're a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. It, they're coming to you for your specialty. And if they're asking you to, to change what you do or express something different or do something different um, that's outside of your scope of practice or in your scope of practice, or you just don't know how to do it, that's not the place to be practicing. It's on the person who's trying to coach you through how to do it. It's an important piece to really draw back to say, hey, we need to um, be responsible for our own license because really as a massage therapist, you have a client come in, tell you what to do, and they get injured. Whose license is it? It's yours. <laughs> well, it was yours. The yeah, it was yours. <laughs> it's, it's the practitioners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so it's not going to matter. I've told this story several times in, in the last several months. I was driving down the road, and my daughter says, Dad, go faster. And I'm like, <laughs> no. And she's like, well, why? I said, because if a police officer pulls me over because I'm speeding, and I say, well, I was speeding because my daughter told me to, that doesn't get me out of the ticket. And it makes me look like an idiot that I'm listening to my daughter to decide to speed in the real world. When we start saying, you know what, as practicing massage therapists, we have a scope of practice and we have a license. 
I do not believe chiropractors know our scope of practice as much as we do. I do not believe medical doctors know our scope of practice as well as we do. Physical therapists, occupational therapists, um, personal trainers, they don't know our profession the way we do, as well as we don't know their profession as well as they do. So I've, the, going back in previous standards, we talked about not uh, begrudging or belittling other professions and kind of having a positive communication towards other medical professionals. That's something that we have to hold on to even in our documentation. Working with children and minors has its glory, has a beautiful aspect. It takes a certain specific type of therapist and it takes a different mentality to connect with the parents in, in a good standard and in a good way. It also takes good policies. Having your policies written and having your standards written is important. So being able to say, like you said, hey, you know what? As of this date, I'm no longer working with minors. Good. You, you set it up. You set it. You're done. Um, but it's when you don't set those and then you're riding that, that line. Well, okay, I'll work on this one, but I won't work on that one. You'll find yourself in trouble eventually. Absolutely. Um, informed contact. Okay. So informed consent of a legal guardian. I, I've seen this go wrong in so many ways, especially with, go away. Um, excuse me. <laughs> um, I've, I've seen this go wrong with 17 year olds um, in so many cases where, um, and I'm going to offend a 17 year old. Hopefully they're not watching because they don't really care about this type of video. Um, but where a 17 year old comes in and says, well, I'm almost an adult. I can take care of myself and I'm, I'm responsible enough and I, I'm going to pay you. So just do the massage. And there are massage therapists out there who will say, I need the money. Um, I've got the schedule on the books. Um, well, I won't get paid if I deny them a service. And that's that challenge. That's that piece where it says we have to be responsible for us. We have to be responsible for our license and being denying a client. Um, I've heard this from so many wonderful people. Denying a client gives you an opportunity to get a new client because you have to have the books open. You have to have your options open and you have to hold true because what's going to happen if I've done this myself where I've got a client who um, is going through something, I, I tell them, I'm sorry, I can't see you. I need you to go see your doctor. And they go see their doctor and they come back and they say, yeah, the doctor said it was nothing. I'm fine. Perfect. I'm so glad. But that person will not have more respect for you and will refer. They'll connect and they'll say, hey, you know what? This person's a professional and they will refer you out to that next person who they're like, well, I don't know if I've got a good massage therapist. I got a person for you. Yeah, they were concerned about me, and so they sent me to the doctor, but they've been nothing more than professional. Being true with it. Holding true to your standards. It's, it's so important. And no more or less important when you're dealing with minors. Um, I, I was dealing with um, just recently a case where a massage therapist was accused of, of injuring a person to a, a fatal case. Um, the, the client died. Um, and the massage therapist um, did a deep tissue massage. Um, and the legal case was about, was the massage therapist liable for the death? Of, of the client. It's an ugly place to be. It's an ugly question to have. But there are, there are situations in massage therapy where we have to be conscious of what we're doing. And I can't, I can't say he was right or wrong. I can say, did he do what he needed to to be safe? 
Did he strive for the standards? And what are some of the things that will, that are on your to-do list of someone comes in and you have a pathology and they're saying, hey, you know what, my calf hurts or hey, I've got this neck pain. Uh, it's been going for a while and it's been shooting up over my head. Um, what are some of your assessment tools that you have to make sure that you are safe? I, I've always been one that I've got no problem. I've got a blood pressure cuff in my treatment room and in, in the spot, as long as it's there and how, let's see, in my 18 years plus of practice, um, I think I've used it a handful, maybe a handful of a, and a half times, five to eight times. And of that, only two have actually had high blood pressure to the point where I said, yeah, we shouldn't have this massage. You need to go see your doctor. But it's an assessment tool. It's something that made me comfortable once I took their blood pressure. I'm like, okay, blood pressure is this. Luckily in the state that I lived in, it's legal for me to do that assessment, which I don't think there's a state where that's not legal for you to do blood pressure. Yeah, I don't know. Because it's, it's a standard assessment tool. It's not a diagnosis. Um, so, but I mean, being able to, to do something to make sure your clients are safe, the more you can do and the more you can know, the better off you'll be. So if I can motivate and inspire a person to take a continuing education class on pathology, that's, that's all I'm hoping for. Just go take pathology classes or take safety classes. Uh, take, you know what, first aid CPR. Because you never know when that's actually going to save the life of one of your clients. Absolutely. I actually have a similar scenario, if you don't mind me chiming in. Hit it up, buddy. Um, this was fairly, uh, I was fairly new, newly licensed. And I had a client who had seen me about two weeks prior, come back to me and say, I know he was more of like a stay at home, busy buddy, work around the house kind of guy. And he comes in complaining about pain in his left shoulder and his inability to write. And Ooh. he goes, I know it's just a muscular thing because it just start, came out of nowhere. And immediately my mind went to stroke or heart attack. Uh -huh. This guy needs some medical help immediately. He was so, so gung ho about getting a massage. And I explained to him, listen, quite frankly, I can give you a massage today. But I can tell you right now, the results can be very detrimental. I really implore you to go to see your doctor immediately. And two weeks later, I get a phone call while I'm at the spa saying, hey, Dan, could you come up to the front? We have a phone call for you, which is weird for me because I, I never worked front desk at that point. And <laughs> I get on the phone and this, this guy's on the phone crying his eyes out, thanking me profusely telling me that the, when I, he left it from the spa, he went to his doctor's, which immediately sent him to the emergency room because he was actually actively having a stroke. And I saved this man's life. And I will forever and always be grateful for my knowledge and my understanding and what, the, what signs to look for in that case. Because if I had worked on him, that man's life would be on my on my table right there on my mind weighing on my conscience. And I don't, you know, not, not only do I want to make sure everyone's living, you know, and, and well, I don't want to live with that for the rest of my life. Absolutely. The, the, I don't know if the ability to massage after that would be very strong. I, I, I think if you had someone die on your table, you may not want to work. Yeah. I, I had a couple of people who, who put, uh, Diabetic patients, be careful. Diabetes is definitely one of those things that you have to be conscious of. Blood clots, uh, phlebitis, yeah, all of those. Those are huge pieces that we always want to be conscious of and make sure that uh, you're connecting with um, effectively because you have too many people um, who are like, oh, well, I'm diabetic, but I'm fine. Uh, really? But let's, let's look at this a little bit more. Let's just assess the condition. Let's make sure we're all in the right spot and, and dealing with the right things. Um, it is, it, yeah, just being able to say, I, 
I've told this story before probably. Um, I had a client who came in, she complained about tightness in the back of her knee. Uh, it kind of felt like a contraction uh, that just didn't, uh, she couldn't make it contract or like go. And I'm like, that's, that's a big enough sign for me that I can't work on you. And I sent her to the doctor and uh, she left and I didn't hear from her. And so I started worrying a couple of days, a couple of weeks later. Um, and so I went and I looked at the soap notes and she had come in and seen another massage therapist after that. And I was a okay. <laughs> I was like, I don't care. She went to the doctor. She went and she's now getting a massage from another person. If she doesn't feel comfortable working with me, that's fine. And if it was nothing, a okay. I'm a worry wart. I can be a worry wart and be all right with you um, going and find someone that's going to be more comfortable for you. Um, yeah, I, I, you, yeah. There, there's a lot. Uh, hey, Donna Sarvello, it's good to have you back. Where is your hat? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not on the road. I don't carry my my beanie uh, when I'm at home. Uh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, okay. Uh, we, we have a wonderful comment for from Zerlin about hospice massage. What about hospice massage? I love the concept of hospice massage. Have you have you ever thought about going into hospice? Myself, no, I actually have not. It's only because I before I was a massage therapist, I actually worked in in a hospital setting and worked with the terminally ill, and it really kind of turned me off. What didn't you work in? <laughs> What, was there a job? Uh, you I have never been the, in law. <laughs> you have not done the law. Okay. All right. Good. As long as there's one, you've got something to look forward to. Um, hospice massage is huge. Hospice massage is one of those areas that I have such respect for the massage therapists who Absolutely. go through the hospice training and are really vetted to understand uh, end of life experience and end of life need. Um, and I have seen massage therapists who have worked on every condition uh, that I can think of. I'd say every condition known to man, but I'm not positive. Um, but people who are on their deathbed and they're coming in and working with them and they look at their health history and the 14 pages of what's going on and they are absolutely comfortable saying, you know what, we're here for your best interest, for your best need. Um, end of life is a huge piece and it, it's it's a little heartfelt right now i have a nephew who has cancer um and he's uh, at his end of of days and he's six years old and so being able to see a young child kind of get relief um and nobody put this on facebook i'm watching um but it, it's it's huge to see what a person needs in that end of life, which is completely different than the health history aspect. And then just denying clients because of this, but that, that open training to be willing to work with people in those end stages is huge. That, that is such an amazing aspect. And when you look at minors and because we're going to pull right back to that, that minor aspect and kind of go into, you're going to go into hospice, um, Many years ago, I had a opportunity in hospice, uh, or not in hospice, to go up to Dornbecker's Children's Hospital in Portland, Oregon, which is a children's hospital for cancer patients and others, and kind of connect with the patients there and kind of just play with them and work with another massage therapist who talked about play therapy instead of massage therapy and being able to connect with people in a heartfelt way because you're there. And that is a lot of times the best therapy you can do. Is it hands-on? Absolutely. Um, is it hugs? Absolutely. Is it moving their arms ways that they can't? Absolutely. But really the hospice mentality is absolutely huge. Uh, hey, Jill Burkana, it's good to, good to see you as well. Um, so it's interesting and important to kind of look back at a couple of these key pieces that uh, that are there um 
we want to be always looking at making sure that identity and information of our con um, of our clients is at the utmost guarded and protected. Um, this is in every side of the industry, let it be massage therapy in a spa, massage therapy in your own office, massage therapy in a hospital clin clinical setting, um, hospice itself, hospitals, wherever it is, you still hold those responsibilities true. Um, and then when you look at children and being able to remember that children have not only their own responsibility where they sign off, but you have that legal guardian that's responsible to sign off as well and that you obtain that prior to any, um, prior to any treatment. Um, being conscious and being safe. Um, Dan, once again, thank you, brother, for coming and, uh, and participating with me. I threw it out there as a possibility, and uh, I'm glad that you, you were able to get your baby to bed and uh, get, get us uh, together again. Um, We'll, we'll be seeing each other again very soon, I'm assuming. I look forward to it. All right. Thank then. you. The hour has flown by. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion with Ethics Outside the Box. As you've seen, Nathan uses many second-hand stories of ethical situations. If you'd like to share your story or you have any questions, feel free to contact him and Nathan at educatedtouch.com. If you have just watched this video and would like continuing education for home study, you can go to shop.educatedtouch.com under the home study options with the date or episode number to receive your exam. If you would please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, we will keep you up to date on new videos. If you'd like to attend one of our live courses, you can find upcoming scheduled events at www.educatedtouch.com. Thank you for joining us today. Ah. <laughs> Now, <laughs> bloopers, go. gotta love them. Yep, 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 yep. Ah, stupid fly. Oh, Facebook went off. Perfect. That's a crazy timing thing.